for Jan Nilsson, CEO of Combigene, to present this company. Please, Jan, the stage is yours. Thank you, um, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is our first appearance in this fora, forum. Uh, and by the way, we are customers of Vator, one of those. Um, quite pleased so far. Uh, I'm going to structure my presentation like this. My name is Jan, as David said. I'm the CEO of CombiGene, uh, which is a gene therapy company based in Stockholm. Uh, we are listed. We are on the first north uh, growth market. I'm going to talk about gene therapy as such, the area in itself, the paradigm shift that represents, a bit about our company, the leading Nordic gene therapy company, and our ambitions uh, right now. I want to highlight a few things already on this slide. Gene therapy as such can revolutionize medicine, certain parts of it at least. And uh, several big pharma deals have been done over the last couple of years. We did a deal, as you can see down there, with our lead asset uh, last year. That was a preclinical asset that not even had gone through the pivotal talks and biodistribution studies. Um, we have gathered a lot of expertise and our ambition now is to grow the company in, uh, in business development, finding new assets primarily. Now, gene therapy is, as I said, uh, a tool that can revolutionize medicine, as Ashley has already done. Uh, compared to other pharmaceutical interventions, gene therapy can actually replace uh, a defective or missing gene, like in uh, bleeding disorders, for example, or, or others. Or you can use it to get the body to produce its own pharmaceutical, like we do in the, terms, in, in the case of CD01, for example. Uh, it's more like you actually can cure. It's more resemblance to cure than just alleviating symptoms. Um, you get a very long-lasting effect. If we look at our colleagues that have been working in the, in the Parkinson field, we know that after one single injection, they can see production of that protein in the patient's brain after more than 10 years. And we can see in monkeys in more than 15 years after one single injection. So it's, even from that perspective, it's a paradigm shift. You don't get a drug every day or every week. You get it once, maybe. You can be very targeted. We talk a lot about these days about precision medicine. This is really precision medicine. And the, the several new gene therapies have been approved over the last couple of years, both in the US and in Europe. And we can see also the main focus is in oncology, in CNS, and cardiovascular disease. So, about our company, our, we have a product portfolio of two projects. CDO1, which is in epilepsy, uh, which we licensed to Spark. That was the deal I was referring to. A CDT2, which is a project in a very narrow disease called lipodystrophy, uh, which I will allude to more in detail later on. Over the years now, we have been listed since 2015. We have gathered a lot of expertise in different areas. Uh, when we say we are the leading Nordic gene therapy company, I refer to viral vectors i.e. when you use a virus to deliver your gene into the human cell. Um, and we're the only company doing that, to my mind, in the, in the public market. We know a lot about that. We know how to define preclinical studies, clinical studies, and I would like to highlight this one, because in, in our line of business, CMC is extremely important, or manufacturing. It's one thing to manufacture a small molecule, GMP. It's a very different ball game to do a viral vector containing two genes uh, 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 according to GMP, a good manufacturing practice, the quality needed to go into man. And also to scale that up. Uh, we couldn't find anyone in Sweden that could help us with that. So we had to turn abroad to find manufacturers, actually. And we have now a track record that we can take a project from the academia all the way through to sign a deal with Big Pharma. So our business model is to in-license uh, assets from external networks, either from companies or from academia. And we develop them up until preclinical uh, pre or clinical proof of concept. And then we license, uh, if it's a broad indication, i.e. many patients, 
we will seek as partnership with Big Pharma. That benefits the patients, us, our shareholders, because that's the quickest way to reach the market in that case. On the other hand, if it's a narrow indication, a limited number of patients, limited number of physicians handling those patients, we can contemplate to go all the way ourselves. Uh, you can say that our deal with Sparks was a proof of concept of our business model, if you like. Uh, we licensed CGO1, the epilepsy project, from Lund University and Copenhagen University, Professor Mira Kokaya and Assistant Professor David Volby uh, back in the day. We developed it, and some of you that has been on our webpage may recognize this uh, cartoon. We call it the subway map. Uh, it really describes, actually, all the preclinical steps we took to, to develop and and increase the value of the asset. And we had an out-licensing out deal uh, struck last October with Spark Therapeutics, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Roche, the world's third largest pharmaceutical company. Now, our project then, epilepsy. That is a very common disease. Most of my colleagues working in the gene therapy field are addressing very rare diseases. But this is not the case here. This is 0.8% of the population, something like that, that are afflicted by epilepsy. The main cause of epilepsy is that the nerve cells have too high activity, uh, and that can cause seizures. This is a very busy slide. Uh, so the take-home message here is really to describe how common the problem is. The headline here says that in the US, uh, the EU5, sorry, the big five in Europe, Britain is not part of EU uh, no longer, and Japan, we have short, just short of six million individuals that are afflicted by uh, uh, epilepsy. And on the right hand side, you see a pie chart. We are interested in the ones that have a focal epilepsy, i.e., there is a specific part of the brain that actually triggers the epileptic uh, seizure. So you, you have a well-defined area to treat, actually. That's about 60% of patients. And with the current medication, we can control the seizures in two patients out of three. Now, if you do the maths here, 5.7, and the one-third that can't be uh, get control with the current medication, and the 60% that have a focal disease, that still leaves you with more than one million individuals. That, and in, in that group, where we, where we look for our patients, or Spark will, actually. Uh, <coughs> now, the basic principle here is uh, why you get this problem with epilepsy. This is a cartoon depicting the interaction area between two nerve cells. By the way, how many nerve cells do you have in CNS? About 100 billion. And how many interactions with other nerve cells have every single nerve cell? About between 1,000 to 10,000. So there is a lot of those interactions areas. Now, if the, inc the, the uh, activity increases, um, you have a problem. The interaction actually takes place by using uh, neurotransmitters. And in this case, I, what we have is glutamate. That's a neurotransmitter that actually makes it easier for the cells to interact with each other. If the activity increases and you get a synchronized activity throughout the brain, you will develop a seizure. Now, here we have our patient with a focal epilepsy, pharmacoresistant. The yellow part of that brain, that's where the focus is. That's the part of the brain that is responsible for triggering the epileptic seizure. What we then do is go in to, to, through a small hole in the back of the head, you can see with the catheter. We inject CGO1, and the, then the, the virus, the little green thing here, that will actually infect the, neurons, uh, the neurons, and it will deliver two human genes into the nerve cell. Uh, the, the genes that we code for neuropeptide Y and Y2 receptor. And neuropeptide Y is another neurotransmitter. And the, the beauty of that is that 
uh, that's stored inside the, the nerve cell. And when the activity increases, the nerve cell then releases neuropeptide Y. It binds to the Y2 receptor. And the, the uh, activity then goes down to a normal activity. So you don't develop a seizure. So that's the project we have just licensed to Spark. The one we're still working on very much, we are still working on CD1. We are not working less now than before the Spark deal, actually. Uh, but the focus right now is on lipodystrophy as well. And here we are more like most of our colleagues. Um, this is a rare disease. It's somewhere between 10, uh, 1,000 to 2,000 patients uh, throughout uh, Europe and US. And there are no approved treatments for partial lipodystrophy. You have two major groups, partial and complete. And we are looking at the partial ones. Uh, <coughs> and there is no treatment, as I said. It, since it's so rare, we believe we have a very high likelihood of, of getting a, an orphan drug designation, which has some regulatory implications, as well as uh, prote market protection implications and, and uh, pricing impl implications. I do agree with Tobi, uh, our first presenter here today, that you have to make sure you have a, a solid business case. So what do, do we achieve with um, CDO2? First of all, what is characterized, what's characterizing a lipodystrophy patient? They can't store fat like you and I can do. So they have uh, virtually no subcutaneous fat. And then the body turns into internal organs to store fat. And one organ is the liver. And if you have a liver full of fat, you have a lot of subsequent consequences of that. Uh, you have a very high uh, blood fat. You have a tendency to, to develop type 2 diabetes very early on in life. You have sky high, uh, high lipids in the blood. And, and <coughs> pancreatitis is also a problem. So what we do now is we actually introduce a mitochondrial protein to the liver. And it's UCP1. Normally you have that in brown fat. What is brown fat? You don't have that. When you were very small you had it. And hibernating animals have it. The bear and stuff like that. And it's actually, what UCP1 does, does is instead of the mitochondria producing the gasoline for the, for the, uh, for the other cells in the body, it actually only produces heat. So you take the fat in the liver and, and you, you turn it into heat. So you, you consume the fat in the liver. So it's called uncoupling of the, lip, uh, of the respiratory chain. And if you actually cleanse the, river, uh, the liver of fat, we believe that we can correct all these problems associated with lipodystrophy. Again, a business slide. Uh, we have let an external company look at the, that the potential. Uh, it's important that we can make a solid business case uh, for this. And these are the number of patients you can see in the US and Europe. You see in total something like 1,000 patients on partial lipodystrophy. <coughs> you, you deduct uh, the normal 20% individuals too frail or for other reasons not uh, candidates for, for, for gene therapy. And if we can reach between 25 and 50% of those patients over the lifetime of the, this product, uh, with a price you can see between 1.3 and 1.5 million dollars for one treatment. We have a, a potential of between 700 and uh, 1.4 billion US, 700 million. I'm oh, sorry. <coughs> I mentioned we several times. Uh, we are a, a core uh, group of people. I have my colleague here, uh, Peter our CEO, uh, recently hired. Uh, Karin, uh, you see on my, my right side there, she is my right hand. She's my chief scientific officer. Um, she's been uh, with me since 2018. Does a heck of a job. And then we have uh, <coughs> Luis, our CFO. We also have a very experienced team when it comes to drug development. Uh, with Annika, who is a preclinical expert, she had gene therapy in her thesis from Karolinska. Martin, the CMC guy, I mentioned again that how important CMC is. 
uh, or manufacturing. <coughs> Panila, uh, preclinical and clinical, uh, Alvar, very experienced project manager. And uh, another recent employee is Birgitta. And you can see on her title how a lot of, of emphasis we put on uh, finding new assets. She's a uh, director of, of in licensing. Again, a very experienced board. Four out of these uh, five members have done the same type of, of journey that we do in Combigene uh, and have experience from biotech. Um, the only exception is actually Peter in the middle. He is the finance guy and he is the uh, Nestor in our board. He was part of the uh, first board in 2015. Now, strong position and ready for the next step. Uh, one consequence of the deal with Spark was that we, we got $8.5 million up front. I still have that on a dollar account, by the way, which was a uh, struck of luck. <laughs> um, and the total deal, you can see, the deal value is $328.5 million. Um, and that is, uh, in my view, a very good deal for a preclinical asset. Uh, we have $50 million coming up in preclinical and clinical milestones and $270 million in, in, in uh, commercial milestones. And on top of that, we have royalty rates uh, ranging from mid single digit to low double digits in the futures. And that will be, if, it, this, if this thing goes all the way, that will be more important than the milestones, of course. And one feature, as I said, one consequence, what we have a, a relatively good cash position, but we also got internationally recognized as a gene therapy company. Uh, and our focus now in the, this, the, for the rest of this year and next year, as you can see here, is actually continue uh, and, and nourish and, and sh and, uh, the, the relationship with Spark Therapeutics. They were visiting us the other month, last month here in Stockholm. We meet them regularly. Uh, we will also focus a lot of efforts on, on bringing CDT2 forward to define the final candidate and do the proof of com uh, clinical proof uh, preclinical proof of concept and also a lot of effort on, on business development uh, to find new projects. So, so what are we looking for then? Um, well, our expertise is primarily in the AAV uh, virus field. AAV stands for adeno-associated virus. It's a small virus. Most of us have encountered that. It doesn't cause illness in, in human beings. Uh, so it's, it's the predominantly used vehicle today in, in viral vectors. We are looking at disease areas, uh, and we have expertise in CNS and metabolic diseases. Having said that, we still will look upon external project on its own merits. So, so if someone comes along with a very interesting lentivirus uh, project, we don't discard that just because it's not an AAV, for example. And how do we do it? We participate in, in conferences, we have an, a, a regular interaction with academia, with other companies. Um, we have also strengthened our organization. As I mentioned, we have Beta on board, solely developed the business development. We have increased our capacity to, to manage projects, so we can take care of a project from day one. And given the financial climate, I would say that finding new projects, uh, the time is right for that. Sorry, so. And I actually have this slide. Uh, I was quite pleased when the first lecture said that it must be a solid business case. Uh, because I, I do believe some, some companies in my field have gone after diseases which are extremely, extremely rare. Uh, and actually some large companies have done the same and they have left the field, because you can't make a, 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 a solid case. It should be a severe disease, of course. Uh, it should be possible to diagnose in time, before the patient has developed debilitating symptoms. And that is not always the case when it comes to rare diseases, for example. So it should be a sufficient number of patients, 
and that gene therapy itself as a technology can address the underlying problem. Of course, that's self-evident, right? And we, this is also very important. I've, we come across projects that people want us to develop that they have not uh, forgotten to take an, a patent in the US, for example. And uh, US is 82% of the market when it comes to patented products. So it's, it's a no-go, of course. The payers, is there a willingness to pay? Because as I mentioned, gene therapy is one treatment, and that treatment costs a lot. So we must show the, the benefit for society apart from the benefit from the, for, for the patient, of course. So um, I started with this one, now I've gone through it. And I hope that you will find the company interesting. Uh, these are the highlights, the way I see it, why it should be interesting for someone to invest in Combi Gene. Thank you.